Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel and if you're new here welcome this is B and you're watching B versus the system where we talk all things STEM and STEM related hobbies and today we are building my home biology lab. We're not actually going to be building it but we are doing all of the prep work beforehand um, in order to actually buy the things that I need to buy. So I've actually already put everything together um, but this is going to be a super chill just kind of hangout session while I put together and kind of show you all all the things that I have put together just in case you want to uh, create your own home lab or if you're just curious about what I am putting together. So let's go ahead and get started. So what I have put together is a Notion page, super easy Notion page, and I've broken everything down into different sections of what I plan to buy. But the first step before you even get here, if you're trying to figure out how to create a biology lab, is really think about what type of experiments you want to do in this lab. And do you even want to create a biology lab? You could want to do a chemistry lab, which I also plan to do in the future. But right now we're focused on biology. It's what I uh, have the most experience in. It's also easier for me to get started. Uh, I'm living in a studio uh, apartment right now and also have a dog. So I don't want too many um, different solvents around, uh, especially since I'm still figuring out like the fume hood situation. Um, I do have one above my oven, but I'm not sure if I should use that. <laughs> so we're going to just start with biology and I'll show you all just a few of the experiments that I'm considering. Uh, the first one is just microbiology as well as parasitology uh, and then also a bit of field identification. So what I mean by field identification is really just going out into nature and identifying different organisms, whether it be uh, plants, uh, probably going to be birds, honestly. I really do like birds as well as like anything else that um, I can find and just kind of observing them and really like just being out in nature to make sure that I can, I don't know, know <laughs> when I hear something that that is indeed that organism. Uh, I do live in the Piedmont and I also plan to travel a bit more this upcoming summer. So I'm very interested in just different bird songs, um, also just some of the different smaller rodent and um, wildlife that's out there. So all of that is in this guide that I have put together. So let's go through it and I'll show you some of the links that I've put together. So the first one and the first most important section to me is going to be PPE, which is your personal protective equipment. Uh, the reason that I think that this is super important is just the fact that you need to be protecting yourself. Like, I don't see why a lot of people just kind of put this as a last minute thing. Um, you know, you don't want to be um, one, like for, I guess, cosmetic reasons, you don't want to like get something on your nice clothes. But the real reason is you don't want to hurt yourself. Um, I'm thankfully not doing anything that's going to get me hurt, but I do want to make sure that I have what I need. So with that, some of the things that I have on here are goggles. Uh, I also sometimes wear glasses, so I have over glasses goggles, but I also have a stylish pair um, that I wanted to show you all. Uh, there's this company called Stoggles, and I don't know, look at these. I just think that they look really cool. Like I could have cat eye. I don't know. I feel like just having cute cat eye glasses would be really cool for the lab. And uh, I looked at the reviews for this one and they're actually like really, like they have a lot of really good reviews. So this is something that I'm considering. I'm not exactly sure which color I get yet, get yet, but I also like the fact that they are blue light just because I'll be going back and forth between my laptop as well as um, just whatever I'm doing in my lab most likely. So that's the first thing. Um, other than that, on this list, I have just the over glasses goggles. So I'll show you all a little bit about what those look like. These are probably more like what you're used to. Um, just industrial looking glasses. These had really good reviews. That's why I linked these. And they are also anti-fog, which was important to me. Um, I just 
think that it's always something good to have. I think a lot of people, whenever they're complaining about goggles, it's the fact that they fog up a lot, especially if you have the over eye or the over glasses goggles. Um, so I may do like different experiments in the future to where like I do need something like where I, I feel like it could fog up. So I just want to prepare right now, make sure that we are all good. So in addition with PPE is the lab coat. And I know that, um, let's see. So the lab coats that you probably typically see aren't this stylish, but um, if I'm going to be real, it's like, it's going to just be me at home. I kind of want to just make sure that I look good. I like, I like aesthetic things, you know? So for me, uh, I really did want to have a cute lab coat. So I'm considering getting this navy one. I feel like it's a good, um, one good quality. It has great reviews. Uh, pink, like it's cute, but I'm not, I don't know. The pink just wasn't doing it for me. Black is also like, I typically do wear a lot of black, but I thought that navy would be good. So I am probably going to uh, add this one to cart. So uh, the last thing uh, in PPE that we have for now is going to be just nitrile gloves. And I think one thing that a lot of people either realize or don't realize, if, unless you've worked in um, a setting where you need to be wearing gloves all the time, is that a lot of people are allergic to either latex or like the powder that is put into a lot of gloves. And I deal with eczema. I also, whenever I was working in the cytogenetics lab, I didn't realize that um, <laughs> I had allergies. And I was like, I've worked in the lab. I had worked in a lab before for like years. And I didn't realize that the PI that I worked with must have had like a latex um, allergy because all of our gloves were nitrile. But whenever I worked uh, in cytogenetics, I didn't even think about it. And I ended up having rashes so badly on my hands that I had to go to the doctors and people were kind of worried, just like, oh, like you have an allergy. Like, let's make sure that you get the special gloves. So we're not going to do that at home. <laughs> we're going to make sure that we have these good gloves. So um, super simple. This will definitely be something uh, that I'll be needing to restock. And I plan to do a video later on just some of the restocks that I'm going to need just so that you can, if you are thinking about starting a home lab, you know um, kind of what your reoccurring cost will be depending on how much you experiment. Like actually how many, how many gloves come with this? This is a hundred, 100 gloves, I guess like 100 sets I'm assuming. So they'll last me a little bit. It just depends on what I decide to do. Anyways. Okay. Let's continue. So with the next thing, let's go. Hmm. We'll go to lab equipment. So let's let's focus on lab equipment. And as I mentioned, the first two hobbies that I plan to do are microbiology and parasitology. So with parasitology, if I'm being real, I am most likely going to be using parasitology as identification, just because it's going to be very hard <laughs> to find parasites that I actually want to uh, explore. Like other than maybe like my occasional amoebas that I may get from the lakes. I also, um, the way that I used to get parasites back when I worked in a lab was through fish. I think a lot of people don't realize that most fish do have parasites typically like in their eyes. Uh, you're like very guaranteed to find parasites as well as like in their mouths. Um, it was just something that whenever we were studying parasitology, it was like the easiest source <laughs> to find parasites. But yeah, I don't really want to do all of that, though I do want to freshen up on just life cycles for parasites and also um, just taking test slides, which are things that people have already or scientists have already put together to where I could just observe them under the microscope. But we'll see. I mean, I will be going to lakes, so there's a good possibility that I'll just come across some parasites at random, um, but just overall microbiology is the main thing that I'm considering. So with that, we're gonna need a good microscope. And I've been considering a few different microscopes. I've done a little bit of research and 
there are two microscopes that I'm considering. So we have the Swift SW350T, and I like this one just because it's trinocular, which means that it has like three uh, lenses. You have like the binocular area here, as well as the top for just um, like observation, basically. Like if I wanted to allow you all easier access to seeing what I'm seeing underneath the microscope, which I mean, I run a <laughs> STEM related YouTube channel. It makes sense to have a trinocular microscope. I feel like I will have lots of just different either lives or other ways that I will need a uh, camera mount. So makes sense for that. Um, I'll also show you the other um, microscope that I'm considering. So with this, uh, this, though this, I like, there's not really actually a difference or that big of a difference in price between the two microscopes that I am considering. Actually, let me take that back. The first microscope, okay, the first microscope, the, the SW350T was 20. 269, so 270, whereas this one is, okay, yeah, there, there's definitely a difference. <laughs> My bad, y'all. Oh, only one more in stock until next time, until next time. Uh, this one also is trinocular, but it, it is so-called research grade, which, I mean, I like, <laughs> I like that. I don't, when I looked at the reviews before, um, these had slightly better, these had slightly better reviews than the other one. And I know for sure that um, if I'm being like completely realistic, even though it's research grade, it's not going to be of the same quality as I would have had in my lab, most likely. Actually, definitely likely. Like just looking at the price alone, probably wouldn't, but I feel like I can get close. So we are going to probably have a day where we test out my microscope whenever I get it. Um, yeah, that's going to be fun. So other than that, let's see what else is on this list. Oh, okay. So a few things that I did not, um, I didn't, I didn't have links for them is an incubator. So the reason that I don't have a list or anything for the incubator Actually, let me back up. So <laughs> what I would need an incubator for is um, I'm planning on growing bacteria colonies. So I would uh, basically be streaking agar plates and um, just growing colonies. And with that, you need a certain temperature uh, for that. And the best way to do that, as well as just like making sure that you're in a sterile environment, is to have an incubator. However, I've seen people get really creative with their um, their methods for incubation. I've seen some people use like, um, actually, I don't know. I've just seen people use different um, solutions and I'm not sure yet if I'm being completely honest of how I'm going to do it. I don't know if I want to spend the money on an incubator. Actually, like let's, <laughs> let's just Google, uh, or not Google, let's, um, let's look on Amazon to see what comes up when I try to find an incubator. Um, let's see. Oh, and then electronics. They have like egg incubators. Um, it was also like the size that I was looking for. I don't know what I would put. Um, science incubator. Okay, this was actually the one that I saw that I was considering. I uh, was just like a precise temperature control incubator but I'm not exactly sure what size of incubator I'm going to need as well as if I want to spend this money on it or if I want to just use something else. So the jury is still out, but with that, I want to make sure that I do have the precise temperatures needed for incubation. So one thing that was on my list is to get a thermometer, but uh, it would be like a no touch thermometer. So just to show you all what that looks like. Um, they like These are like just like your little no contact like baby thermometers that you have. So nothing, nothing too crazy. But yeah, let's keep going. 
So I mentioned restocks here. Can I zoom? Oh yeah, I can zoom. Okay. I mentioned restocks here. Also, does anybody else watch Bob's Burgers? Love Bob's Burgers. <laughs> but with the restocks, these are things that I am going to have to buy more often. Um, so things that I will be using and will also just need to factor into my cost for my at-home lab. So the first thing that we have are microscope slides and cover slips, droppers, um, which I'll actually just show you all some of these. Some of them I don't think are um, that we need to actually go through. Actually, maybe we will. Who knows? I, I don't want to assume that people know things <laughs> or have like had experience with um, the same things that I have. I think that's one thing that makes science a little bit difficult sometimes is that a lot of scientists assume that other people are on like the same wavelength as them or that have the same esoteric knowledge as them. So um, that's why a lot of people who are in science can be bad teachers. So if you've had a bad science teacher, it could just be that they forgot that not everybody has the same knowledge as them. Anyways, so going over micros uh, microscope slides and cover slips. The cover slips are just, um, actually, let's make sure y'all can see this. This is pretty much what you're going to put underneath the microscope. So you need that as well as like the cover slip just to make sure that whatever you have uh, put on your microscope slide does not get uh, damaged. And there's like a lot of just practice that you need in order to make sure that you are uh, creating your microscope slides correctly. So yeah, that's one thing. In addition, we have droppers. Uh, those are just like the little, um, the little squeezy things that we just saw to make sure that you drop the appropriate amount of liquid. And then we have optical lens cleaner, which you're gonna need for your microscope slides. And I also have immersion oil. So with the immersion oil, um, let's see. This is a very popular brand of immersion oil. And you have immersion oil type A as well as immersion oil type B. So with the immersion oil type A, that's the one that I would assume to get. Like I don't feel like you need type B because type B is if you are doing um, – a whole bunch of just like looking at slides to where you want something that's a tad bit more viscous. And it's just not necessary for a hobby, I feel like. I feel like most people with labs in general just get type A. So if you were wondering the difference, if you do decide to create a home lab like me or just want to get a microscope and are wondering what type of immersion oil you'll need, uh, type A should be sufficient because type B is just basically thicker, more viscous, and is used typically if you are going to be looking at a whole bunch of slides over and over and don't want to uh, have to keep reapplying. Um, also, uh, just to let you know, um, I'll probably do a video once I get my microscope of just like the different uh, magnifications and spe uh, specifications of the microscope. However, um, the reason that you need immersion oil is only for one magnification where people call it the immersion oil layer, but it's just a higher magnification um, that you'll need your immersion oil to see like very clearly your specimen. So yeah, a little, little learning there. What else do we have? Uh, Kim wipes, literally just to wipe. <laughs> it's literally just to wipe the oil away, but that's the brand that works well to where you don't have any streaks in your slides. Uh, you have Petri dishes with agar. So with these, I was considering, like, do I want to take the chance of buying agar plates on Amazon? Or I may use, like, somebody else, another um, another uh, materials company. Or do I want to try to make my own? That in itself will be, like, a whole <laughs> experiment. But I decided to give Amazon a try. So we're going to see how this works. However, I have seen a few other people buy from Amazon and just like using uh, agar plates in general, a hat to just really help make sure that um, there isn't any like additional bacterial growth or to make sure that um, the plates are doing what you need them to do is to store them upside down 
I think that's just like general practice. Store them upside down and um, also store them in like a sealed vac. That works too. So, and that's why I also put the zip storage bags. I'll be putting a few things in there. All righty, moving right along. We are, we have a few more things on here that I won't bore you with too much, but um, these kind of break down the three different hobbies that I plan to have. So parasitology, um, microbiology all the way over here, and then in the middle field identification. So with parasitology, we'll actually start here just because like we're already over here. Um, we'll go and click on the prepared slides just so that you have an idea of what I mean by prepared slides. So these are basically just slides of the organism so that you have a control um, in order to know like if you have identified the organism correctly or if you, like, you, you don't um, go out in nature and you just want to observe to see what different amoebas or um, whatever else is in this pack looks like, then you have that option. So I was looking for a few... I like, I feel like I settled on, okay, they had trichinella and hookworms. Sorry, I'm like thinking in real time uh, because it was really hard to find a pack of prepared slides here that I truly wanted <laughs> just because not every slide has the organisms or not every pack has the organisms that I wanted. For example, you may see some prepared slides that have like just random things on them, like little pieces of leaves. I think I saw like pumpkin seeds. Um, and those are just mostly for kids that want to just observe what um, natural things look like, which is cool. I think it's great to see it from a microscopic level, but I wanna see some parasites. <laughs> like I wanna see some microorganisms. Like that is what I like to do, so. Uh, I was looking for just an option that had a better specimen on them. So I think we'll see if I can find any better ones. I think this was fine. It's also pricey, which I kind of expected. It's like $100. You can definitely find cheaper ones, even within this pack. Like they have smaller if I want to just do uh, bacteria and fungi if I wanted to know what yeast looks like underneath the microscope or a few other things, but I chose the parasitology one. So you can absolutely find slides that are a lot cheaper, just depending on what you're looking for. Um, and even with microbiology, I'm going to find some prepared slides. I did not find the ones that I wanted quite yet, but I'm still out on the hunt. If you happen to be out there and have created um, either a lab at home or you just have a hobby microscope and you found a set of prepared slides that you like, please just let me know. Um, I'd love to just give them a try. And another thing is a parasitology laboratory manual. So I didn't settle on one yet, though I, I was looking at, I believe I was looking at this one that's just literally parasitology laboratory manual and the reason that I didn't settle on one yet is that I'm most likely going to oh wait y'all can't even see it <laughs> this is the one <laughs> sorry about that um so this is the parasitology laboratory manual that I'm considering however I'm most likely going to use a a textbook one. I used to have one from a while ago uh, whenever I took parasitology for the first time. And I really like that lab book, but I'm not sure how to find it again. I'm pretty sure I have it in storage somewhere. So I'm going to try to find it. And if I can find it and it's available for the public, then I will, def Oops. I will definitely uh, link that one. But this is just supposed to help you, uh, I guess, with just some of the life cycles and in, in identifying parasites. So we'll move on to our next hobby, which we're going to jump 
over here to microbiology. So I won't go into too much with this, but I just wanted to include um, some of the books that I thought would be helpful for people, just depending on what type of microbiology interests you the most. Uh, something that could be helpful for you is this book called Introduction to Light Micros My <laughs> Microscopy. Um, it's tips and tricks for beginners. There's also one, A World in a Drop of Water, that a lot of people actually recommended. So I'll zoom in on this one. It's an old book. So <laughs> let's see, 1998. Um, definitely coming up, what, what would that be like? Almost 25 years which, I mean, I still find value value in um, slightly older books. I know, like, as a scientist, you're supposed to not um, cite sources that are past a certain number of years. I forgot how many years, but I still do think that this uh, could be a great book for you. And in addition, if you happen to live next to, like, ponds or small lakes, there's one that I linked on here for uh, freshwater ecology. That could be cool. As you see, my quest for um, the microbiology prepared slides has not been linked because that desire has not been fulfilled. But the other things in here are just collection jars because I'll be going out to some of the ponds and lakes. Um, ooh, inoculation tube or an inoculation loop that some of you may or may not have seen before if you took a lab. Um, it's a tool that's used for streaking your slides. So like whenever you are um, preparing your, your agar slides, a lot of people will use um, cotton swabs, but I don't know. I just, I feel like this actually works better for whenever I've tried it. So I, I always like to use the inoculation loop. It also just tends to be, in my opinion, more sterile. Um, but yeah, everybody has their opinions. And it also just depends on um, what you're doing as well. And then a few other things that I am most likely going to need is a micro pipette, potentially. Like, we'll see. Micro pipettes can be a bit expensive. So that and the tips I will show just so that you have an idea of what it looks like. It's also like, can be hard. Like if they're like, get calibrated wrong, like there's just, I don't know if I want to go into these, these micro pipettes uh, streets, but I do like, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm considering, I'm considering it. And then I just have the tips that are going to go along with it. Lastly, um, that I've put on here is just deionized water as well as a slide box just to keep all of my slides in after I've actually prepared them um, just so that I, I can like label them and just see. So I could also put on here like just Sharpies, but I'm pretty sure I have a Sharpie around here somewhere. And then the autoclave or other sterilization, this is actually where I've seen people get um, creative, which is also why I don't have this linked. I've seen people use like a pressure cooker sometimes for an autoclave. Um, let me actually give me one second and I will see um, autoclave sterilizers. So I'm going to show you all <laughs> the price on this and it's going to be a bit of a jump scare. So <laughs> this is what um, like the professional autoclaves can cost, which I just don't want to pay for, but I have seen people use um, something more along the lines of like a pressure cooker. And I don't think I'm gonna be doing anything like super intense to where I would need to invest so much for my sterilization. I feel like there are ways I can get around investing so much in an autoclave. And it's just me. So I don't feel like, like if there comes a point to where I'm just like, oh, like there's lots of contamination happening here, maybe, but I'm most likely going to get a dedicated pressure cooker. That's the other thing. Do not, <laughs> if you are doing this, do not use like things that are already in your kitchen that you're going to be like making food with. I hope that's obvious, but just in case it's not, 
if you use any like pans or utensils or um, pressure cooker, make sure that it's like a dedicated set. Like this is going to be a way in my biology lab closet that I've designated for this so that it does not get um, cross-contaminated with the things that I use for cooking. Yes. <laughs> Alrighty. So moving right along, uh, our last section that we have here is for field identification. So I won't click too much around these, but I honestly just linked some books. And um, these are mostly just field guides as well as um, there's one that's more of like a track. So I'll, I'll click on this one actually. I believe this one comes with like a CD or something or some type of audio thing. I said CD, Lord. <laughs> it comes with some type of digital audio player um, to where you are able to hear the bird songs of 250 different birds. And I think this is cool and something that I've wanted to do um, because I very much so love waterfowl um, and like just different aquatic birds. However, I also am just in an area to where I hear birds all the time. So I think it would be just really cool to be able to listen and just say like, oh, like it's that bird, it's that bird, um, and just have that knowledge. So this is why I link this book in here. But then I have a few other things um, in here. So like for freshwater invertebrate, as well as wasps, bees, and ants. Um, one other thing about me is that whenever I was in college, I actually managed a biological beehive um, for the Western honeybee or European honeybee. And it was just very fascinating. And it's something that I have want to learn more about. Like, I don't necessarily want to do beekeeping, but I do want to, um, I don't know, just explore more species of bees. Like there are tens of thousands of species of bees out there. Not all of them live in hives, which a lot of people don't realize. So I just want to learn more. And that's why I linked that book. We'll see um, if I can learn just a little bit more about things that you may already know. The last thing that I will list before we close out this video is just the field guide to the Piedmont. So one thing with this and this is actually I'm pretty sure this may have been <laughs> the book that I used whenever I was taking a biology class which I'm kind of hoping not I feel like there has to be a more updated version than 1997. Either way I linked this one because from the ones on Amazon this was the best one I could find there may be um other options off of Amazon but with the field guide, this one is specifically for the Piedmont, which, as it mentioned, says is from New York to Alabama. If you don't live in the Piedmont, don't get a Piedmont field guide. Figure out which type of area you live in and get a field guide for that. But since I do live in the Piedmont, uh, this is just something that I'll be able to take out in nature and really be able to identify different trees, which I love doing. Um, we have lots of oak trees here, but we have different types of oak trees as well as a few uh, beech trees and um, evergreens. So I like just learning more about um, the different species of trees out there and just other plants and foliage as well. So if you're into that, then I definitely suggest that you get a field guide um, and just explore what's in your area. But yeah, this was pretty much it. If you enjoyed this and you're also considering uh, creating a biology lab at home, feel free to take this guide. I'm going to link this in the uh, description just so that you have uh, access to it. I do have links that are from Amazon and our affiliate, so I just want to call that out. But I linked everything that I am thinking about buying. So there will be a video where you see me actually buy it and you'll see... Um, I just have to figure out where I'm going to go first. I'm thinking, of course, the PPE will be first, then most likely the microscope, and, and then like some of the things that I'll need for the microscope. And I think I may start there, as well as some field identification. So I need to get a new um, Piedmont guide, as well as maybe one about either the birds, <laughs> the birds or the bees. <laughs> we'll see which one I decide to go first. 
And then after I do that, I'm going to map out um, just a few routes that are next to my apartment and see um, if I want to start doing some collection so that I can start doing some microbiology. But that is pretty much it for this video. I'd love to know your thoughts below if you've ever considered creating a home lab. And if you did, would it be a biology lab? Would it be a chemistry lab? Or would it be more of like a maker space that's more into um, other fields? Definitely let me know your thoughts. And hopefully you stay tuned so you can see me uh, create my lab in a future video. But until next time, uh, just make sure to like and subscribe so that more people see this video. When I was looking <laughs> for um, content about creating my home lab, it was very hard to find anything that was before like five to 10 years ago. So I'm hoping that this helps a lot of people uh, just if they're thinking about creating a lab of their own. But yes, like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.